mind, it's Tuesday afternoon. I'm Paul John Dykes. And first of all, I've got to say welcome back, Chris. You've been away for a couple of weeks, obviously working on the tan. You come back, um, still double denim. What did you make of the weekend? Let's get stuck right into it. Uh, I tell you, did you know what? It's, it's probably a sad fact, uh, Paul John, that you know, I'm away for two weeks on, on a bit of a, a, a cruise with the wife. I'm having a great time all the sun. And I was still trying to find a way to tune into the Axum, tune into the the, the, the game. Um, got back in time for the uh, you know for the game against Rangers at the weekend there. Um, and actually, I'm surprised I've still got my voice. I know yours is, is going. Uh, I'm surprised I've still got a voice. Whether it was a jet lag or whatever. God, I'm shouting at that TV a lot. <laughs> this um, is the thing. I, I, I'm not quite sure what anybody passing by where we are housed here in the old uh, Axum studio We've not named it yet. It's a wee bit like Lawrence's bar. You're going to have to tell us what we should call it. Um, they must think that there's, I don't know, some kind of torture going on on match day because of the noises that come out of here. But, yeah, I'm suffering a wee bit, I've got to be honest. Um, we're going to be talking about the game because I think what I feel is interesting about having so many, um, such a variety of contributors on Axon is largely you can talk about the same themes, but you're going to get different kind of points of view all the time, different opinions, Chris, and that's why I think we can still talk about the game and some of the aspects of the game, the individual performances, the performance of Brendan Rodgers. Mm -hmm. But as the tagline suggests, once we have spoken about these these things, which are very, very important, I think we also really need to get down to some of the big, big talking points that it's been far too long, you know, in, in terms of being brushed under the carpet and ignored we've got to look at the safety concerns at Ibrox. We've got to look at the reason why Celtic won't take 750 tickets. You know, the narrative has to be um, true. It's got to be truthful. It's got to be accurate, Chris. I mean, I'm going to start off with the football and then we'll get to the bottle-throwing incident. We'll go to the coin-throwing incidents, you know, and and we might even talk about the fact that uh, Celtic have uh, raised their concerns with the SFA over the use of bar. Um, and again, eagle-eyed Celtic fans. I've got to give them a shout out all the time, Chris. It was the unique angle. It was the Celtic TV unique angle that picked up the buck fast, the half bottle of buck yep. fast being thrown at Matt O'Reilly, right? And some Celtic fans watched, and I go, "Wait a minute, my eyesight's not that good. I didn't see it. Look at that, and there's a bottle um, bouncing off the turf. And then, of course, when it comes to the VAR and what John Beaton was actually presented with." I'm not standing up for him, Chris, but what he was presented with compared to the the full action and how that could sway his decision. And again, it's through Celtic fans watching and going, wait a minute, he's not having a look at the full full boona here. Celtic become aware, Celtic make the complaint. So big shout out to everybody. It's not about being a grass. It's about controlling this narrative to ensure that when you go to a game of football, you as a supporter are safe. Uh, the Celtic staff and players are safe, the pundits are safe, and we're going to be talking about all of that. But in terms of the game, give us your rundown yeah. on the performance, Chris. Um, so like, like most, uh, you know, or, or certainly a lot of fans have said, and, and even a few of the, 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 the boys on Axon, uh, before the match, uh, I actually turned my old man and I said, look, you know, we come away with, you, with a draw here. Uh, they'll be delighted because it puts things in our hands. It means that we can go to Celtic Park, you know, 60,000 supporters behind us and I've got full belief that we can go in and, and win not only that game but the rest of our games and, and bring the state home. So before the game, I'd have taken a draw. But when you get into the game and the emotion and the, the build-up and certainly after that first half performance, um, I was like, ah, oh, you know, a, a draw at this point is going to feel like a loss. Um, and, and to be fair, in the initial period after the game, that's, that's what it felt like to me. I felt like, ah, oh, we, we had it. We were... In control, and we kind of, you know, we kind of blew it. I mean, refereeing decisions aside, which we'll come to, but you know, there were, there were a couple of really avoidable goals, um, you know, on our part. So it was a little bit of a mix of frustration mixing in them with a bit, a bit of elation, but then also a bit of realism about it as well, and say, do you know what? Actually, that's that's a that's a decent result to come away from in a, a really hostile Ibrox environment. Um, you know, a team that, that you know, we, we, we were the chasing team. I mean, you know, let's face it, Rangers will probably go and, and beat Dundee, so we are the chasing team. But we, we've we kept ourselves in it. We've done, I think, what we had to do at that match. Um, and I think that's that's really important. Game-wise, I thought it was great. I mean, it, 
we've, how many times have we spoken about it? The Jekyll and Hyde, the first half, second half performance, right? And look, I'll give Rangers a bit of credit. You know, they came out in the second half and, and they certainly played like a different team because I think we had them under the caution in the first half. Right for the first minute, I mean, our uh, cult hero, Maeda, you know, that was br- I don't think barely, barely had time to sit down. And I'm like, it's him. You know, I, I couldn't believe Chris, it. Chris, where were you watching the game? I was, watching over, I was watching it over my, uh, my parents' house. Yeah, that's, that's our kind of tradition. I go over and watch it with my old man. Right. So, right. Like, you know. And I, and I tell you, I, I didn't get to Lawrence's bar. I was I was wanting to get to Lawrence's bar. I wish I'd, I wish I'd uh, got there, but I was just a bit, I was a bit jet lagged, and I thought, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go go and do what we usually do. But you know, we just sat down, and there it is against the best right back in Scotland, mind you. You know, let's let's get that clear. You know, it was the best right back in Scotland apparently. Uh, and there's Irv Dyson. You know, absolute energy levels. I, I don't know what that boy eats, but I mean some of it. Um, and there we go into the net. I thought, brilliant. This this could be one of those days. This could be the five one, the six two, you know, type of thing. So I had I had that kind of confidence, and I thought our play in the first half could have led to that kind of result. You know, the amount of chances that that, that we had, the type of build up play. Hatati, uh, I thought was playing outstanding. I thought the middle of the park was great. Awata was sweeping things up. Bit wasteful with his distribution. I, 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 I did not notice that. I know a few people have said that. I think he's. His ability to, to pass the ball and, and, and make, you know, sometimes even simple passes kind of kind of let him down. But I thought overall, it didn't look overawed. I thought he played played pretty well um, and then certainly showed up that, that midfield. And Matt O'Reilly, and you know, Matt O'Reilly is one of these players that I've recognised. Sometimes when you watch a game on TV, you don't necessarily see everything that he does on, on the park. And, and I remember, um, you know, back in the days when I had my season ticket and, and in the games I go to, you notice a lot more when you're at the game. Uh, and I think the stats reflected his performance, and he's getting praised from all angles at the moment. Not just for the penalty, which was, I mean, that, that was a piece of class. That was pure risk. But the his overall performance, you know, the amount of duels he won, the, the his use of the ball, his movement, his mobility. Um, I, I I've got to say, at the time I was saying, oh, you know, come on, Matt, get more into the game, get more into the game. But then, on a second watch, you actually start to notice a lot more. And I, I think, you know. Good on him. He really rose to the occasion, and, and particularly with with our captain in the uh, you know in the you know in the park. Uh, so I thought you know middle to front. I thought it was great. Kyogo, some brilliant running. <sighs> Going to be a bit wasteful, but look, he's 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 done it so often for us. So so no issues there. Um, and I thought I tell you when either came on. Well, that's that was Jakimakis like the way he played. Really really good. Um, and you know I've got I've got to say it as well. How many times have we spoken about Joe Harp? Joe oh. Joe Hart last apart from the obvious, I would love us to win this title for Joe Hart. I really would. Last season he's retiring. Come on, let's let's give him the double. Let's give him the double because he is playing out of skin at the moment. He really is. And I, I, I'm almost at the point where I want him to reconsider retirement because he is keeping his in games. It, it, like, he's not perfect. He's he's had a couple of wobbles. Show me a goal that doesn't. But I think in particular this half of the season. He's mm-hmm. really shown what he brings to the team, and I think that's great. So, yeah, that first half I was delighted. Second half, and we're going to—I know you're going to bring it up—but second half, the penalty, and the one thing I noticed about that, and I've noticed it throughout the season, um, is that when we either through our own fault or through a decision like that, when we suddenly find ourselves a little bit under the cosh, there are definitely players of the team who look a bit panicky, who look like they maybe struggle to keep that focus and I thought you know I, I thought the contrast between first and second half where we looked comfortable and then suddenly we find ourselves you know it's down to one goal again and it's a bit like oh you can see it's starting to wobble a bit and actually you know it's Rangers second goal which was which was disallowed you know the disallowed goal rightly uh, in, in my opinion I don't think anyone can argue with that but you could almost see that they had their, their tails up um, they were galvanised and we looked shaky and I think we've seen that too often this season. So we really need to try and get a grip on that, whether it's through recruitment in the summer, maybe bringing in a, a Wanyama type midfield destroyer to kind of shore it up, um, or just looking at getting guys in who are a wee, wee bit mentally stronger when, when the chips are down a bit to, to see games over the line. Because we are, we look great going forward. We can put teams under pressure, but we seem to struggle a wee bit when we're under pressure in the park. And that was, that was something that was evident. So, but overall, yeah delighted really really thought that the, the, 
it was a good result and certainly when you've got a couple of days to reflect i think i think we're in a great position now well this is the thing chris right because you're speaking about celtic for an hour a day on a celtic state of mind and you do things like watch games back i mean i know a lot of fans don't do it unless it's a particularly good victory um, for example somewhere on the shelving system behind me there is the seville uh, DVD, probably the VHS as well, um, and many <laughs> players, in fact, Martin O'Neill uh, admitted when we last did a gig with Martin O'Neill that, you know, they can't watch it, but we do watch it, and we watch it to analyse, and it's incredible, watching something a second time, how much you notice that you don't, in the midst of the battle, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up about uh, Matt O'Reilly, I'm going to speak about him, I'm also glad you brought it up about Joe Hart because I absolutely share your sentiments on that one. Leading into the game, I'm going to start with Joe, right? Because leading into that game, Chris, I was talking about the emails we've all been receiving um, in relation to the Celtic Player of the Year. Obviously, the awards are coming up. And at a certain point, Matt O'Reilly was a stick on for me. Stick on. He was absolutely brilliant. Apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for the voice uh, failing me a little bit. Thankfully, you won't be uh, relying on me to sing your song, any kind of song. But I'll, I'll get through this, I'll get through this. Um, so Joel Hart, I, I think I was talking about, you know, he might actually be our player of the year. And what I was saying is, in terms of, of Brendan Rodgers and the way that he's able to sometimes transform a player, sometimes resurrect a player's career. I'm not just talking to Celtic. I think that's something that he prides himself on, developing and progressing players. And it's not just youngsters, and I keep saying this, right, because some people think when you're watching a game of football, Dyson Maeda is rubbish at X, Y and Z, and it will never change, and that's why he's at Celtic. I've heard a lot of people saying that. I don't agree with it. No. I really don't agree with it, right? And I remember um, talking to Brian McClare about this, because obviously he had a brilliant position at the Manchester United Academy. He then moved on to the SFA. He was far too bright and uh, creative and diverse to, to last at the SFA. That's why he, he wasn't there for the entirety of his contract. But some of the ideas he's got around football and development are sensational. And when you talk to him, you know, you can get this insight, Chris. And I, as I've said on this show time and time again, if I talk to football people, I'm just a sponge. I just want to hear, you know, their insights. And, and Chalky talks about that. He talks about the fact that a player can develop. He doesn't believe in natural ability. To a, to a point, he doesn't believe in it, right? Yeah. There are certain people who are built a certain way that allows them to naturally fit into a certain sport, and he, and he accepts that. But what he talks about, and, it, and it's obviously been written about and discussed time and time again, is this 20,000-hour rule, whereby I give you a guitar 20,000 hours of practice later, and you can play that guitar. Right? Yeah. Two, yeah. Right? yeah to a standard, or I can give you journals and manuals and research material, and 20,000 hours later, you can pass an exam. It's that kind of thing. So if you train and practice with a football for 20,000 hours, you will have the essentials required to be a footballer. And that's what Brian believes. Others believe, I'm not saying that's true. Others believe you've just got this God-given talent. Someone throws you a ball and you can start running with it. I'm not sure what you believe. I, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. I, th I was going to say, I think that I think there's elements of both. Um, I, I think there's natural attributes that a person has, whether it's a strong work ethic, whether it's the, the ability to get their head down and work hard, um, you know, whether they're just built a certain way. I mean, like, as, as we always joke about, you know, I'm pretty sure I was never, I'm never going to be a, a great defender. You know, I was never going to be a great defender. I'm too, I'm too short. Could probably have done Greg Taylor's uh, position, you know, he seems to be doing okay. But, um, you know, so I, I, but I think there's certain attributes that go with that. But I, I agree. I think, you know, everything can be taught. And I look at Dyson Maeda, you know, the biggest frustration for me is he's sometimes his final ball. When he's playing as a, as a winger, you know, he, he runs down there, beats his man, gets to the byline, and then he'll hat a ball that's probably no landed yet. You know, uh, that that's one of the frustrating elements of his game. But that can be worked on. And I think last week when I was uh, telling up when I was driving back up from Gatwick, uh, I was listening to a couple of the pods, it was the story I think you told about Callum McGregor. Then Callum McGregor actually um, being coached to place his shots from yeah. outside the box, you know. Yeah. Um, and so there are there are tweaks to someone's game that can be that, that can be developed throughout their career. And I think a good recent example of that is Scott Brown. Um, Scott Brown, uh, and I think it was 
it was under um, possibly you know maybe kicked off under Daly, but I think it, it, it really came to fruition under Brendan Rodgers the first time. His first thing, he changed his game um, and he became very much that midfield general uh, for me that we always thought we always kind of wanted him to be. But he started to bring it to the forefront, and he was in his you know what late twenties you know approaching his thirties at that point you know so that's quite late in a in a player's career to start developing new skills. I also remember Neil Lennon uh, further developing his game uh, under striking and becoming a real captain, a real leader um, at, that, at that time. You know, so these are guys who were at the latter stages of their career and started to develop their, um, you know, some of their attributes or really refine some of their attributes. But I think, yeah, there's an element of you have to have the right attitudes. You have to have some of the right uh, behaviours um, to really make that happen. I mean, we've seen a lot of wasted potential. You look at... Uh, with the greatest respect to the boy, but you look at the Tony Watts uh, of the world, you know, a guy who burst onto the scene, lots of attributes, but I think uh, it was Johan Mialbe who mentioned at the, uh, the Axon event uh, that we were at, that he, um, he, you know, he had the, the, the ability, but the attitude wasn't necessarily there. Um, you know, the, the, the attitude to really develop the areas of his game that, was, that they were lacking, you know, he just didn't really grasp the opportunity to go and develop that. And subsequently, you know, he's become a bit of a journeyman. As I say, no disrespect, he's achieved more in his football career than, you know, I probably ever could, but um, maybe not reach the potential that he could have. So, yeah, I think that when you've got a coach, a good coach who recognises that he can raise your level and you take that opportunity, I think you can become a better player well into to the twilight stages of your career. Uh, for me, you should never stop learning. Um, and when your fitness, your natural fitness starts to maybe deteriorate a bit, as we've seen with players, um, you know, you, you develop and tweak your ability to compensate for that. You know, so if you don't have the electric pace, be smarter with your passing, be smarter with your movement, your positioning. You know, these are things that, that, that I think footballers need to look at. And, and I would like to see more Scottish players take that on board um, and, and, and play like that. Yeah, I mean, it takes us into the conversation because, again, I think there's a there's a train of thought whereby a, a manager can only progress or develop a young player. And what we've seen this season is someone in Joe Hart who there's been tweaks made to his game, Chris, and what we've seen is the benefit of those tweaks. They're pretty obvious. They're obvious tweaks because Ange wanted the ball at his feet. Oh, that was never going to be a, a smooth transition, was it? Because... We knew from his time at Man City, it was spoken about by his manager, he wasn't a ball-playing goalie. Um, and I think that Brendan Rodgers saw it in the pre-season. He stole the jerseys in, in one of the Japanese pre-season games. And we've never seen it since. We have never seen it since, you know. He's never made one of those moments where after the game, me and Kevin McCluskey are going, what was he thinking? Try to back kill the balls and do shimmies and all that stuff. We've not seen that this season. Concentrate on being a leader and a goalie and this is the type of performances you get from Joe Hart. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he looks much more assured in the box, looks as though he's commanding his box a lot more. Still, uh, I think Kevin had mentioned that the, the weekend, I still still get a little bit panicky about the, the, the passing out, you know, from the, the, the back. And sometimes, you know, we inadvertently put ourselves under pressure. And I kind of understand what we're trying to do there. You know, we're trying to draw the Rangers front line onto us so that we can hit them on the counter. You know, I, I kind of can see a bit of logic in doing that. But when you've not got a great ball playing keeper and, you know, defensively, we can still be a little bit shaky. I prefer a keeper to do the simple things. You know, just get it up the, get it up the park. Let, let your outfield players do the, do the hard work. You do your job. Play it simple. And, and, and I prefer that. And I think when Joe Hart's allowed to do that, he's as good a keeper as we've had in the last few years. Uh, I, I really do. Um, you know, looks confident there. And, and he's short stop ability. I mean, the, I remember there was the comment that we expect you know, a Celtic goalkeeper would be able to make saves. But, you know, it's if it was that easy, anybody could be a goalkeeper, right? I mean, the point is, it's not easy to get your, you know, particularly your big guy, Joe Hart, says, get yourself down and make a quick reaction save. Get yourself back up and make the second save, you know. And, um, really, that can save you points during, during a season. And I think without Joe Hart, we would have fallen much further behind Rangers in this in this, in this league uh, Grace, I really do. Um, so, yeah, nothing but credit for him. I, I think he's been a great servant up to now, and I think he's really showing what we potentially might miss in the summer. Um, so, from a recruitment standpoint, that's got to be a priority position for us. It really massively, is. massively. See, when you think about other than Vasilis Barkas, right, the runny goalies that we've had. Yes. When you think about Arthur Boric, Fraser Foster, Craig Gordon, Joe Hart. You know, that is the kind of level, that is the standard. And as you say, when we go into the recruitment in the summer, 
has started already, let's be honest. We need to make sure that the selection process for the successor um, to Joe Hart in the Celtic goal has to be up there with that kind of calibre of goalie. We cannot, because he's shown how many points he saved. And I know people say, that's his job. Right, I get it. But we've had goalies in the past who haven't fulfilled <laughs> that role. Um, I'm going to bring this up just now. We'll get back to the uh, nitty-gritty of the game. But William O'Toole, has anyone counted the sheer volume of incidents at Ibrox in recent years involving throwing missiles? Right. Not quite, but what I will do just now, William, is I'm going to run through a few of the notes we've got in relation to uh, various uh, factions being unsafe at Ibrox, be that a player, a pundit, a coach, staff, fans, ref, etc. Right? So let's have a run through that. So I think that um, initially, I mean, the wider public, obviously, after the uh, league title win under Stephen Gerrard were at risk because of the scenes at George Square. Um, there was a clean-up bill of about 100 grand, but everybody's seen the, the ongoing battles. So that, that's a kind of wider public issue that needs to be dealt with. Um, and obviously, it's something that we hope we don't see at the end of the season for the same reasons anyway, Chris, uh, celebrating a league title. Um, we've also got to look at uh, the Willie Collum situation, whereby you know he is a, go uh, a referee who has been under threat in the past after uh, Glasgow Derby fallouts, and I think also Kevin Clancy this season has um, had received threats at his home address where he lives with his wife and his young child. And again, this has all come through um, the uh, aftermath of a Glasgow Derby. Kevin Clancy, of course, that was uh, about a year ago, uh, he received death threats. We've also got uh, the fact that Celtic no longer accept tickets when we are only offered 750, and the two reasons given for that is the... Uh, fan experience and fan safety concerns because um, I think in terms of our contributors, certainly Declan McConville has been in amongst the 750 um, and he's spoken about a constant a constant uh, barrage of missiles being thrown into the Celtic support. Um, you've then got the fact that uh, a bottle was thrown at the Celtic physio during a, a game and that resulted in the jailing of a Rangers fan back in March 2023. Uh, you'll remember the photograph of the physio with his head split wide open. This is all things that are happening at Ibrox or in the aftermath uh, due to the, the Rangers support. Listen, you've got a Rangers coach in the women's game going up behind Fran Alonso and headbutting him in the back of the head. I mean, even your coaches aren't safe. Um, Chris Sutton uh, was a security risk uh, after his media accreditation was rejected for a Europa League game because he wasn't safe at Ibrox. Joe Hart goes into his goal for the second half of a game at Ibrox back in April 2022 and he's faced with broken glass. Um, it's down to Joe Hart, the man we've already spoken to, to go to the referee and obviously bring it to his attention. We've had batteries thrown at Lee Griffiths. We've had a fan running onto the pitch and attacking Scott Brown. What happened? Oh, we'll just put him back into his seat. No problem. These are the things that we've had time and time and time again. And at the weekend, there were other incidents. So initially, we were aware that missiles had been thrown at John Kennedy. I wouldn't mess with John Kennedy, even if he were 100 yards away. I wouldn't mess with a big man. He's an absolute giant. However, it happened. And then, of course, yesterday, whilst we were on line doing our, our broadcast, Chris, it became evident that Matt O'Reilly, after not even celebrating his goal, it was the run after taking the kick, and he's ran naturally right to the side of the goal, turned round and taken the celebration of his fellow players, and a half bottle of uh, Bucky had been thrown in his direction. Right yeah. Now, if that collides with your head, the damage is horrific. I, I'm going to use my own example of this. Right, I remember being at a gig at Murrayfield, and it was Oasis, probably 25 years ago or something, right? And um, we were waiting on them coming in. There was a great set of support bands. Happy Mondays were playing. Doves were playing. I remember Lucas Age used to be in the glass bottles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This wee guy, I hit just in front. He was just in front of me. You're talking, like, you know, half a metre in front of me. And this missile was thrown from God knows where. And you could see it, you know, just growing in the corner of your vision. And the noise when it hit the boy's head, the head oh. just opened up. That was horrific, right? Th this is the kind of thing that can happen at the football. Now, there's there's so much. I mean, there's some examples. There are just some examples. I'm sure there are more. And it comes down to the point of safety, safety concerns, right? And, you know, 
every single time we play a game at Ibrox, we get the same old stuff getting rolled out. Oh, isn't that a shame for the spectacle of the Scottish game that there's no Celtic fans there? But let's let's be truthful about it and let's talk about the reasons why we're not there, right? So the ticket allocation was reduced, Chris. You know, they'll not admit it, but it was partly due to the fact that we had a party so often in the broom won't stand after absolutely scalping them. But it was also partly due to the fact that they wanted their seats for season ticket holders so they could get a big um, load of money in at the beginning of the season to keep them going throughout that season. I mean, come on, it's, it's a joint reason why they've done it. But to give you 750 and for your fans not to be safe is the reason there are no Celtic fans at Ibrox at this moment in time. That's the reason that, you know, the, the resolution that's been introduced in, in recent weeks, which is quite ambiguous, actually, with the terms of the, the percentage, because it's around 5%. It's going to come into play next season. But the reason this has occurred, the reason there are no Celtic fans there, is due to the safety concerns of the Celtic Football Club in relation to our own fans, Chris. So it's important to underline that, and no, none more so than after a weekend where there's been another two incidents, at least two incidents that we're aware of. There was also the incident whereby they had gone to the stadium and they had stashed a number of weapons, baseball bats, all this kind of stuff. In this, the confines of the stadium, when they were meant to be going in to organise one of their sensational, uh, globally renowned TIFOs, and they had gone in and they had put all these weapons ready to who were they going to attack with weapon yeah. baseball bats? Seriously, so there's so many examples, Chris, but it's it's so important to ensure that the narrative is not skewed on this one. No, absolutely, and, and you know one of the biggest tragedies about this is this was a televised game on Sky, so you know th this game has got a, a kind of global reach, right? And, and certainly, you know, it's watched by millions uh, around around the globe. And what we had on on the park was, from a neutral standpoint, it was a great game of football. But then you see incidents like this, and you think ah, that that's. A dreadful optic for our game. It's a dreadful advert for for our game. And look at you know, there's there's derbies and there's matches and in, in, in various countries around the world. We have fan trouble and you have ultras and you've got you know. I remember in Italy there was yeah, I think it was Inter Milan. A scooter gets chucked from the top of the the, the, the stand down at the bottom. You know, so we're not. This is not an isolated case, but this is a this is a repeatable layer, you know layer of incidents that has happened. You know, I, I don't know how many. Of the, the last matches, I would say above what 75 80 percent of the last you know, how many ever matches at Ibrox. How many times are we going to talk about it? How many times is it going to be highlighted? What's it going to take for some serious proactive action to be taken to prevent this? Is it going to take someone to actually be hospitalized for someone's life to actually be, be uh, you know, jeopardized or, or taken as, as a result of this? How in 2024, when football is supposedly at the peak of its professionalism and its organisation and, you know, all the, the, the controls and so-called safety elements we have, are you capable of stashing weapons to, to take any again? I mean, I mean, tell me how that how that happens. You know, this isn't in the 1980s. This is, the, this is 2024, when diligence and awareness and security controls and cameras and all that kind of stuff should be absolutely at the peak. How does that happen? Um, and you're right, fans aren't in there because of initially because of restrictions put on by, by their Ibrox club. So they've created this catalyst of a situation. Um, and I know, I mean, I've not met a Celtic fan who wouldn't, you know, crawl on their hands and knees to go to, to, go to, to a game against Rangers, right? But they're not going to go and, and, and jeopardise their safety or the safety of their, their kids, maybe, or their partner that goes, they're not going to do it, and rightly so, right? And at the moment, there are no guarantees that if you were going to go into that stadium, whether it's 750 or 7,000, that you're going to come away from that game safely. And that should be the minimum expectation for a supporter, is to go and support your team at whatever ground and come out of there safe. You know, come home with your family, come out of there having enjoyed a game of football. And we need to address not only this hateful, disgusting, violent mentality that, that you know, and listen, I know we've got elements in our own support as well, and so do every other club, so I'm not just focusing on Rangers, but this is the incident we're talking about, is that, you know, as you've said, we've had a physio injured, we've had you know, play, fans and coach onto the pitch to attack our personnel. We've had a goalkeeper who luckily enough spotted broken glass on the goal line. You know, how, how does broken glass get in a goal line without anyone noticing it? Well, what's going on there? And why the hell are we not holding the club to account for this, right? Whether they like it or not, 
your fan base is part of your responsibility once they're in that stadium, right? You have to take accountability for the actions of your fans. You have to take responsibility for the safety of every fan in that uh, in that stadium. This needs to stop. This needs to stop, and we need firm action. And I think Celtic, the fact they are calling this out and going to the SFA and saying, do you know what? This isn't on. This is not on. We've had enough of this. Sort this out. And we, I, I, okay, it's it's Rangers. There'll be people saying, well, you're just going after your rivals. No. This is the point where we need to take action. This is the point we need to take action, right? doesn't matter what team it happened at. The fact is, it happened. It happened during that game. It happened within uh, Ibrook Stadium where there were only Rangers fans in that, uh, in that crowd throwing missiles, uh, throwing bottles at players. It needs to stop. It needs to stop, and, and there needs to be a strong statement. I think we're taking what looks like hopefully strong action, but it has to lead somewhere because this can't continue. Someone is going to get killed if this if this continues. And the one thing that, that occurred to me, given that that was happening during the game, what would have happened if Celtic had won that game three two? And how what does that have... how does that affect the decision making process to the officials? Oh well, they well there you go as well. Um, and, you know, we can't confirm anything. We don't know what the officials are thinking. If I was standing in the middle of that stadium with that level of intimidation, I'm not sure I could be objective. Um, you know, when you're thinking about your own safety. But I'd, I'd, I'd be terrified. I think if we'd won that game, if we'd won 4-3 or 3-2, or, or I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had sort of ran onto that park and tried to attack the players. And I think they'd have got there. You know, I think they'd have got through. So, really terrifying situation that wouldn't be allowed in any other event yet. We seem to, we'll talk about it for a bit, it'll be in the media for uh, a week or two, maybe, if we're lucky, and then it'll, it'll go quiet. And that's that's my fear. Yeah, I mean, I've seen probably more coverage of the fact that the Green Brigade, apparently, and I'm not going to do the Billy Conley thing with the uh, the air quotes, right? Yeah. Smuggled a banner. Smuggled a banner into the Al- Almondville Stadium. How you smuggle a banner that size, I will never know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Someone joked that it was uh, they were trying to nick the Livingston uh, uh, surface. Like, I mean, it was yeah. huge. It was bigger than a carpet, right? No chance was that smuggled in. But I've seen more kind of media attention um, and the Green Brigade being lambasted. It's almost as if now yeah. they're a, an easy target for that kind um, of the, the narrative. Is so Aye, absolutely skewed, right? I mean, I don't know enough about uh, stadium safety certificates. If anybody in the uh, comment section knows more than me, does that breach the, the safety certificate? Because I know that initially when you think a safety certificate for a, for a game, you're thinking about the structure of the stadium, aren't you? Um, yeah. I don't know. Does that come into it? Is that something that could be written into the safety agreement uh, with the authorities? Because obviously if you don't get a safety certificate, then the game can't go ahead kind of thing, you know, and you're going to lose revenue and, and you could be penalised if you can't allow the game to go ahead due to the safety of um, not the stadium in terms of the, the actual building but the yeah. people that are housed within and um, your security and your control of those people within that stadium is something that needs to be um, it needs to be highlighted, but we need to be strong as a football club, Chris. You're right. We need to be strong on this because we've already had a physio with a split head. Now, Matt O'Reilly, by the way, there's a wee comment coming up here. I'm going to, I'm going to tie this in. Mickey Boy, uh, 80, comes in. O'Reilly admits that a Leco Madrid transfer did affect him for the games after the break. We now have the real Matt O'Reilly. That's natural. And I said yesterday that it's not about having your head turned. Because for me, Chris, your head turned is, oh, I want to join that team. And the club's no let me join the team. And then you get the old down tools scenario. I don't think it was that. I just think, you know, it's kind of knocked them a bit in terms of, right, I'm trying to focus on my job at hand. But I know that, you know, in a few months' time, we're going to have another big bid coming in from Spain. And, and then you're thinking, right, what do I do? My family, my... This kind of stuff, you know. So I, I, I get that. I totally get it. Here's the thing, though. Matt O'Reilly is being chased by Atletico Madrid. How do we keep him? How do we convince him that his future, even for an extra season, stays in Scottish football? Because that incident at the weekend certainly is not going to convince him to stay in Scottish football. That would turn you away. You imagine we attracted, for example, one of the, the most prodigious talents in, in European football, right, on loan, right? And that kind of stuff happened to him in his six month or twelve month loan. And then it comes to get the option at the end of the season, he'd be like, nah, no chance. That's a madhouse. I'm not going. I'm not going to Scottish football. It's crazy. I could end up with my head split open. So there's that aspect as well, Chris, isn't there? 
Yeah, there absolutely is. And I mean, I think we we forget about uh, the age of someone like Matt O'Reilly as well. You know, this is a young guy. Um, you know, he's not a he's not a twenty seven, twenty eight year old player reaching his, his peak. He's, he's a young guy who's got a massive career ahead of him. And you know, given his ability, based on what we've seen so far, could have he's you know could be able to pick and choose what league he goes and plays in. You know, he could have a, could have a choice for a, a couple of locations. And look, you know, I, I think players are realistic the, enough to know that you know there is trouble. Uh, of, of a degree in almost every league in, it, in, in it various clubs, but when you are deliberately targeted with a with a bottle and, you, and you're in that stadium thinking, how am I going to get out of here? How am I going to get out, out, out of your safety? Look at look at the amount of vitriol and amount of hatred that's that's been directed towards me. You know, do, do, do you make a decision internally to say, do you know what? I could go somewhere else. I could up my money. I could you know up my chances on the international stage. I could get a really high profile and be playing amongst top players you know what's what's the tipping point you know maybe that's maybe that's it in fact you're saying well you know i could also i could also go and maintain my safety as well and maybe that in my family and um you know because let's face it sometimes this stuff's no restricted to in the stadium you know that that's glasgow and the surrounding area it's not a big area you know you think it will happen to lenny yeah you think it will happen to lenny throughout his playing and managerial career yeah absolutely and you know so there's, there's precedent set here um, and I think it's it's dreadful because I I'm, I love Scottish football. I'm a promoter of it. I'd love to see us grow and expand and 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 somehow you know maximise our, our our potential um, and get back to the days where we're attracting top players. But you know, you think of players' potential you know signings. They look at that, and that's a game they would watch, right? That's a game they watch because you say, "Oh, they're playing that match." But then you see that you see those incidents, and they may be thinking, "Ah, oh, well, actually, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe not for me." Um, and that, that that's a tragedy, not, not just for our club, but for anyone that, that we want to attract to Scotland. So, yeah, really, really poor, really shameful. Um, and and you know, as I say, I know that we've got half wits in every in every support, including our own. But the mentality to go into a football match with the intention, with the intention of trying to injure a player uh, or, or or a fellow fan or anything like that, I'll never understand it. I'll never ever understand it. No, and it needs to be discussed. And again, yes, people might think that we look for opportunities to have a dig at the board and all that. We don't. They're just so forthcoming. <laughs> um, the board need to be strong. They need to stand strong on this one. I know that, uh, obviously, it's been reported to Police Scotland. There's an investigation ongoing on both incidents. I also know that they have contacted SFA in relation to the, the beating incident, which we'll get to as well. I'm very keen to get as many people as possible into the discussion. And Tommy is commenting on the YouTube. And what a cracking avatar that is as well. There's also the stash of weapons that were smuggled into Ibrox prior to a derby game. I know, that that was insane. So the club have come to an agreement with whatever the ultra group is, and they were to go in and, and organise their TIFO. Um, <laughs> and again, I use that in inverted commas, TIFO. And of course, they've gone in, and instead of just doing that, they've also stashed weapons so that they can be tooled up um, for the game coming up. Incredible scenes. Now, you've also got Gordon Coney uh, reminding us of the fan that tried to attack Scott Brown. Yep, and he was he was firmly placed back in his seat. He wasn't arrested or even ejected from the stadium. Incredible scenes. Um, wasn't beating one of the officials. I, I'm thinking back to the... I, was, I think he ref that game. Jonathan Brown, um, whoever the goalkeeper is next season, going back to Joe Hart, needs to be first team ready. Can't have a project signing between the sticks. Also, on the back of that, Jonathan... I don't even think we, we we can run with the two guys that are also there in, in respect to Scott Bain and Benjamin Segrist, um, the seldom seen Segrist. You know, he's in he's in a, an exclusive club at the moment with O, James McCarthy and Kobayashi, right? Honestly, yeah. there is definitely a comedy sketch show involved in this somewhere down the line. Um, maybe some of our comedians in the, the uh, comments can tell us um, how that would run. But I mean... The four of they guys, what, what do they do for training? How do they travel together to training? What do they do off the park? Where are they? Who are they? Probably, probably, the, FIFA, get... probably the, FIFA, the FIFA League, you know, probably playing in the, the old uh, the PlayStation League. You know? uh, for me, it comes down to contributors and non-contributors. That's what it comes down to for me when it comes to a Celtic squad. And if you don't contribute, go. And you've got to go. And if you're a young player that's not contributing because you're in that kind of middle ground between the B team and the first team, you go out on loan, and that's a development loan. Um, if you're one of these guys that I've just mentioned, and that's the four that frustrate the life out of me, 
then you, you've got to move them on. Honestly, Chris, we can't go through another transfer window and come out the other end with those four players still on the books. Facebook user, um, sorry your avatar's not appearing. I think there's a wee uh, registration process you go through on the Facebook page. But you're saying, do you think the new allocation should go ahead if safety concerns aren't met? No. That's a great question, by the way, Chris. I would sure. say no. I don't think it should. No, I think uh, you must, the, the absolute minimum expectations I say is you must be able to guarantee the safety of fans to, to the to the greatest extent you possibly can. Look at this 60,000 park here, there's 50,000 uh, uh, Ibrox. You can't account for the behaviour of every single individual, but you have to put controls in place to, to, to minimise the risk to, to the absolute nth degree. You, you must. Uh, and you, I think you, what you spoke about, the, the certification element, that has to become an element of that. It has to become a, a, a part of the criteria because, you know, it's not just you know grown men they go into these uh, go into these matches. You know, there's, there's women in there, there's kids. Um, you know, there's every demographic you can imagine, and the, the danger level at the moment, as evidenced at the weekend, is extreme. Uh, is extreme. You know, and and the one thing I really hope off the back of this is that obviously the next games at Celtic Park again similar. We've got our support in there. What we don't want is it to see any retaliation or reaction. You know, let's let's show that actually we can lead to the front on this and say, you know what, our support will not throw missiles. Our support will not target opposition players or referees or officials or anything like that. So I think it's important that we actually, as we are kind of trying to show the high ground here, that we can maintain that and demonstrate that. Um, but yeah, uh, for me, until clubs, not just Rangers, but all clubs in this country, can actually demonstrate and show they've got controls in place to to secure the safety of their of their support and their opposition fans, then no for me I wouldn't I wouldn't take I wouldn't take this new allocation. I would want assurances. And I would also want if there there was a failure to meet those uh, safety controls, I'd want accountability to be set squarely with the club as well as the individual fans. Because you're bringing fans into your stadium, they're in your house you control their behaviour or you put controls in place so their behaviour, um, you know, the risk of it is mitigated. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the, I think it throws the whole thing up in the air, actually, you know, this kind of agreement, this resolution to, to try and get fans back in. I think the weekend throws that into disarray. Jungle Lion, great to see you. Welcome back. Hope you had a great weekend. Where where those objects were thrown at Kenny, they came from the main stand and uh, where the big wigs sit tells you everything tells you everything. Yeah, and again, you've got to look at the, the fact that, right, see if these instances continually happen, Chris, right, and the CCTV continually doesn't pick it up. There's a few issues with that as well, because yeah, that's absolutely. one of two things. Either A, your CCTV is not good enough, or B, you're lying. And you're not, you're not actually providing us with the CCTV footage. It's one or the other, and if it's the, the former, then it needs to be upgraded, because that's exactly the reason why it's there to pick up on incidents such as that. I mean, I've been at football games where people have been having a wee fly drag or, or you know, all this kind of stuff. And I've seen stewards getting sent right up to them. And it's like, right, CCTV can pick this kind of stuff up. And um, if it's not good enough, get it replaced. Or are you lying that you don't have the footage? This is interesting as well, right? I may not have gotten into football if I were a youngster now. They've ruined a beautiful game. Ping pong's for me now. Um, ping pong. Hey, don't joke. Ping pong. You've seen that Bruce Lee video where he's doing it with the nunchucks. I don't know if it's AI, but it's a cracking, it's a cracking sport. Very difficult sport. However, on that point, I do concern myself with this, right? Because I think that you know, back in the day when I was growing up, there was still the kind of memory of the 1980 Hamden riot, for example. Oh, yeah. So I was born in '78. You had the, the Hamden riot in 1980, and there was always this concern around. Not going to the football, per se, but going to a Rangers game. You know, going to a Celtic Rangers game, there was always that. And I never went to my first Celtic Rangers game till the early 90s. I, I remember it vividly. I've spoken about it on here quite a few times. They beat us 3-1 at Celtic Park. Mowbray scored a header. It was the equaliser New Year's Day game. But up until that point, and I've spoken to a lot of Celtic fans whose parents weren't keen on them wherever they lived, going out to a Celtic top on or going to a Celtic Rangers game because it was this fear. This is football's changed so much now that it's a brand. Uh, the games are brand, the leagues are brand, the clubs are brands, and it's all about trying to sell that brand to a wider audience, Chris. Because when I started going to the games, largely speaking, it was blokes and it was groups of mates, and it was. It's different now, and and for the better, right? So the the all seater stadium was a massive part. 
and developing and progressing the sport into a situation where you can go with your wife and two kids. You know, that that's something that you want to do. And and I think the, the point B raises is a, a really valid one. Do you really want, as a kid or even as a parent of a kid, to expose the next generation to that kind of violence, that kind of aggression and that kind of risk? Yeah. Do you know, it, it's it's one of the most heartwarming things that you sometimes see. You see a group of kids, you know, run about together or, or even, you know, playing football on the old fields. And they've got a whole range of short, shirts on, you know, they've got Celtic top on. The, the Celtic Rangers. away, the Celtic third yeah, kit, yeah. Celtic and the, home and the, kit. And, they're all, and, you know, they're all playing together. The Irish kit. Kind of exactly. You think, that's what it's about. The kids are just picking up their, their, their shirt and they're going to play and nothing matters. And I remember, you know, doing, doing as a kid. But the problem is, is this element within every support, but particularly in Glasgow and, and, and around when it comes to Celtic and Rangers, that you know, you're either one or the other. And, and it shouldn't it shouldn't be that way. Look, I, I know it's gone back in the day of the 80s and 90s and it's, um, you know, I always remember my dad telling me he was very similar. He wouldn't, uh, you know, being a firefighter, um, you know, he was very conscious of safety and things like that. So he very, you know, he went, used to go to the old games or the old stand, you know, the terraces and stands, but he would never um, take me to, to an old firm game. He just, he just wouldn't, uh, as it was back then. Um, and now as a father myself, you know, I, I, my wee boy's got his Celtic top and he plays with his pals, and, you know, his best pals, we, you know, as a Rangers fan and all that. There's a real innocence there. Hatred isn't something that's inherent. Hatred is something that's taught. It's something that's cultivated. It's something that that is, you know, it, it, it sort of, it's like a parasite, you know, it grows from generation to generation to generation. But it's only there because you allow it. You know, if you're a parent or you're, you're a, you know, affiliated with a family, your child will only grow up to learn hate if they're taught, right? That's that's the bottom line. Uh, and I would love to get to the point in this in this country and certainly in this city where that no longer happens. I don't think it will happen in my lifetime, but I, I, you know, I would love us to get to that point where, you know, fine, you can be a rival for ninety minutes and on a match and you know, a bit of banter, but it should, shouldn't go beyond that. When you're talking about kids, you know, getting targeted because they're they're in a Celtic top or a Rangers top, they don't care. That, that, that's not right. That's, that's not right. So, yeah, I, I know I, I know we're kind of going away for the for the for the actual on field stuff here, but it's it, it's just something I would love to see change and and really embrace that element where, where you know sometimes see kids out and about and it doesn't matter what shirt they're wearing, you know, just having a laugh with their mates and and why why can't we do that as adults? Why can't we do that as teenagers, and adults, and take it through? You know, what's what's the what's the factors behind that that's feeding this poison? Um, so it's a yeah. It's the allowance, it's the allowance, that's what it is. You know, if you allow it to breed, then it will exist. And it's all about you know, having a zero tolerance approach to this, Chris. And I think that, you know, Celtic, by refusing uh, to take the tickets, it's almost as if it's emboldened um, those at Ibrox. I mean, some of the, the comments even that comes out of the, the boardroom at Ibrox around, well, we are, you know, here as the board, you're never getting the broom blown back. And it's just this pig Yeah, yeah. It's, it's antagonistic, it's like, it's like, come at us, you know. Do, do I know. Your work. You know, we're not going to change. You know, it's a little, <laughs> what chance have you got? And our authority within Scottish football is a toothless tiger, and it's not dealt with a situation early enough, and it gets to the point sometimes where it's gone too far down the line to actually drag it back, and then it's a compromise. Why should it be a compromise? Why not deal with the situation when it rears its um, extremely ugly head? Stephen Kennedy, 1.44 million viewers, sky hit for our game on Sunday. Absolutely incredible. It's almost like your monthly viewers on Axon. That's not bad, Stephen. <laughs> um, no, but... You know, the broadcasters, and, and by the way, we don't have a good enough broadcast deal, but they do think about things like this. They think about yeah. the game as a spectacle. See if you remove all the carnage, and it's important that we talk about it, but see just for a moment if you remove all the carnage, and you look at the game, and it's three each, right? I mean, it had a bit of everything. I was saying this yesterday to Tino. We'd done our wee wonder round Paradise yesterday. Tino from the Celtic Exchange. Go and check it out. It went out at six o'clock last night on the YouTube channel. And I was saying, you had all the elements, you know, you've got the, the, the brilliant, blistering performance by Celtic in the first half, the comeback from the home side, um, and then you've got what looked like a wee winner near the end of the game, and then there's the equaliser, and there's the, the controversy around some of the decisions. <laughs> so other than all that other stuff, that all the grotty stuff we've been talking about, what a game of football it was. 
Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, it's funny because you always think, oh, that was a great game for the neutrals, and you're just like, oh, God, to be a neutral <laughs> watching that game, because <laughs> you, you really struggle to enjoy it when it's happening. I mean, we were... You know, I think we gave gave our dog at least three heart attacks by shouting. You know, every time I went in or, or something happens, but that that's that's what we live for, right? And it, and it was actually as a spectacle. It was, it was superb. You know, it, it was two teams going at it. And I say I I I I'll give Rangers all the credit in the world in the park. You know, they made a game of it. They came out in the second half, did what they needed to do. Um, you know, but we, we stuck at it. We got the goal either, which was you, you were just like, yes, that's it. That's that's us. We're there, and then you get the. Uh, the ball with the world at the end with Matondo, which like can can happen, but yeah, it doesn't do much for your blood pressure. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't really do do much in a good sense for your blood pressure. But it was a great advert for that game, Scottish football itself. You know, it, 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 I'm sure there were people you know with no affiliation to either side watching that, thinking, "Bloody hell, that was a, that was a good old a good old match." Three three is a great a great result. Um, and we need, you know, that's the side of the game we should be embracing. That's the side of the game we should be uh, promoting and showcasing. And that's what you want to see on TV, because that, as you say, might feed the better TV deals and get more expo- exposure for the league. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, yeah, it, the problem is, is that we'll lay ourselves down continually with the, with the other stuff, with the variety sides. But, yeah, as a game, brilliant. Loved it. Uh, thought it, thought it, was, thought it was good. A bit hard to take the, 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 the result at the end, given how, we, how much we were in control at one point. But, yeah. Kind of wait for the game itself to part now. Really, really desperate. I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, loads more to discuss. Thank you all for getting your comments. And Thomas Burns, what name that is? Celtic should refuse to play at Ibrox as the Rangers quite clearly cannot guarantee the safety of players and staff. I would be interested to know how that feeds into the, the safety certificate. Let us know that because sometimes you've got to go for the Al Capone effect here, right? You want a resolution. You can't you can't get them for. Um, you know, human trafficking. So what we'll do is we'll get them for the old tax. Sorry, any Rangers fans for bringing that up. I know it's a, it's a tough subject for you. Right. But you're right. Maybe it's a safety certificate issue. You get them on a kind of round, round the, the, the back. Um, that That's the motive of that. I think it's called the Capone effect. When, when you get them, somehow you get them. But no, maybe for what they're doing, properly wrong, but you get them somehow. Get them. Yeah, absolutely. William O'Toole. Um, good morning, Mr. Dyke. Nobody calls me Mr. Dyke. Dear me. I trust yeah. you are well. All the action contributors have to call Mr. Dykes, that's it. Nobody else. <laughs> and, and there's also, you've got to do that a wee bow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's meant to be a secret, <laughs> mate. Uh, Stephen Kennedy, is this starting earlier today? No, I set it up earlier because it was well organised, Stephen. But um, unless something big happens, like, you know, the, um, a new manager or whatever, it's 12.30 every single day. And even when we do have uh, an impromptu emergency broadcast, we still go out at 12.30. So rest assured, we will be here. Monday to Friday, 12.30 on the dot. Mikey boy, <clears throat> if you are in a fight in a boozer and you use either a glass or a bottle to hit someone, you're in big trouble. That is a serious offence. The downplaying of this by the SFA and our club is criminal. Yeah, you've got to be more proactive, right? So yep. somebody didn't have their, their heads split open at the weekend, but they could have done. Somebody didn't have their eye taken out at the weekend, but they could have done. Do something about it. Smell the glove. I hope their game at Dundee is on. So do I. This is my mentality. I don't want it to be off, right? I want that pitch to be waterlogged like a quagmire. I want it to be like the old Barrafield training pitches where you're up to your ankles and something different and it's muck, right? Get them on a heavy pitch after that war on Sunday. Dundee fighting for the top six. I want the yeah, game to go ahead. Have a sand out. Bucket of sand, that'll sort them out. I, honestly, I want it to be an absolute quagmire. and I, I want them to be up to their knees in muck. Like when you used to watch the old uh, games on Celtic TV. And uh, the, the tackles would be flying in. Everybody was caked and muck. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. The white, white shorts were just dark. Suddenly you couldn't see the hoops, you know. It was just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. That's old, what we want. Style, old style. That's what we want at Dens. We want Dundee to get a point in that game. Or three. Uh, we've also got Mikey Boy again. I was at that gig. Oh, we're talking Oasis at Murrayfield, right? And JGI comes in to confirm it was 2000. That would die. That, that makes sense. I don't keep my tickets. JP Mason has got a brilliant wee folder. He keeps everything in it. I haven't got a clue where any of my tickets go. But yeah, 2000. I'm sure it was standing on the shoulders of Giants. Crazy good day. It was beautiful sunshine. Happy Mondays. Uh, what are the Happy Mondays? Just absolute shambolic. But doves were, were superb. And I remember Jimmy Goodwin coming out and somebody had an Irish tricolour. And he pointed them out. 
and he oh, called really? it that that Celtic flag. He says, "I was like, all right, Jimmy's one of the good oh. guys." Um, I think later he did a wee interview for the, the Celtic View. Henrik McLarson, I've not watched that interview yet with um, Sutton. I've not had a chance to see it. it. Yeah, I was trying to get it when I was when I, when I was abroad. I can see it. Um, but yeah, I want to I want to watch. It. I think Cassie had watched it and, and said it was absolutely brilliant. So yeah, I'm keen to I'm keen to see it because that was you know that that year was probably my favourite as a supporter um, was just the uh, you know the Sutton Harps and Larson uh, combination. But yeah, brilliant strike force. God, how we could uh, how, how we could use them now. Unbelievable. And again, I, I think about world class players in my lifetime and. Um, how often we're going to be blessed with world-class players maybe in the future. I think what you'll see is you'll see a player maybe at Celtic through um, our Celtic supporting lives who maybe becomes that player or is regarded as that player yeah. at a later stage in their career. Um, and I'm not saying because it's a debate to be had, I'm not saying Van Dijk is world-class. He was probably the, the latest one um, of that that kind of standard of player. And I'm not saying he's as good as Larson before anybody says no, no. anything about it. But the reason I'm bringing up Van Dijk is, um, did you watch that Neil Warnock clip that's doing the rounds on social media where he says that he almost he almost signed Van Dijk from Celtic for three million quid? Neil Warnock, he's fallen into this this kind of bracket now where you know how all these footballers and that and ex footballers and managers just tell loads of nonsense stories for an audience yeah. and they end up on podcasts. He's fallen into that category. No chance, pal. We signed him for two point two. We signed him for. He wasn't a guy that developed like over a period of six seasons. We knew straight away the value of Virgil Van Dyke. There was Absolutely. no way you were getting him for three million pounds. Don't talk nonsense, mate. Utter, utterly, utterly false. Yeah, I mean, but that, that's that's a hallmark of a one one You know, he's a just just a big mouth. But the, the thing is, he's a caricature, right? And the fact that yeah. one of our so-called top clubs thought it was a good idea to appoint him as a manager is just ludicrous. Henrik McLarson, Cantwell was a poor example. Yes, he was. Uh, instead of calming things down, he pours petrol on the flames with his stupid push on Carl McGregor. Well, I think uh, I think he felt uh, I think he felt hard done by that Silva's taken on his, his role as the the starting pack mind villain, right? I mean, Silva was just can't well be you know marginally worse here. I think uh, on that on that uh, part. Marginally, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but um, but yeah, I mean. The diving, the theatrics, the you know the, the the blatant cheating to win the penalty, um, and then you know you get Cantwell coming on thinking here, yeah, hold my beer, and what does he do? He goes and starts to try. I mean, start try start a Rami. <laughs> the first part was he posts the hold me back picture on his socials. And it's like, what's wrong with you, mate? You know, come on, scrappy you know, dude, scrappy uh, dude. The thing um, is, Chris, right? I, you know, to be a, a Celtic captain. Um, I think that you've got to come in a diff in a certain mould, right? Yep. Because you go down the history of the Celtic captains. But what we've seen in the uh, captain prior to Carl McGregor was um, a first-class degree in shite housery, and that was Scott Brown. And That's I just it. think that Carl McGregor needs to adopt a wee bit of that. We've seen that. We've seen touches of it. We've seen touches yeah. of it. I think. See for this game at Celtic Park, these people are weak. See, you can't well to this world. They're weak, and I think you can tap into their mentality. You can yeah. wind them up, and if you wind them up and they lose their focus, they will do something daft. I mean, he's taking great pleasure in the fact that he's getting held back like a daft wee boy in a school playground, and he's putting yeah. it out in the social media. I would be looking at that thinking, you're a target. I'm coming oh, for you. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and we saw Scott Brown do it expertly. Remember, he did it against Drew, he'd done it against Morelos multiple times, you know. He just, you know, he take the hats. He would take the the, the wee niggles. He would just get up, he'd go on with it, and he'd, he'd be like, "Yeah, come on, keep keep going, keep trying it," you know. And I th I'd like to. I think Callum's a different player, right? He's a different player for Scott Brown. Um, I think he's got really good attributes as a captain, but I would like to see a wee bit more of the gnashing of the teeth. I'd like to see a wee bit more of the angry side that you don't really see enough of from from Callum. Um, I mean, look, you know, he's a great captain. He'll go down, and you know, is is one of the top. Celtic legends and he's a homegrown or so brilliant but yeah just a wee bit more wee bit more angry and maybe as we talk about developing players maybe that's an element of Callum's game that he still has to develop and tweak a little bit and maybe we'll come with age when he's he's not able to maybe influence the game as much with his own play um, you know ability but actually you know he's got the, the tactical and the, the intelligence to say do you know what right I've got a different role to play now and I think Scott Brown did that you know, Scott Brown tweaked his game where he would just he would get in players' faces. He would become a problem on that park. And I would like to see Callum 
um, you know, become that, or we bring in a player that can kind of do that, maybe maybe on his behalf. But yeah, I, I think we need a little bit of, and I think actually across the whole team, we need a little bit more nastiness. And I don't mean go out there and injure players, absolutely not, but just a wee bit more yep. street savvy, street savvy on the on the. Yep. On the and the one player that I thought lacked it more than any other at the weekend was Giang. I think to play at this this level, Chris, you need a wee bit of that. You really do, and it's savvy. And it's a bit of grit. And I remember thinking about Jota that he had everything in his game except that, but that wee bit was missing. But he actually developed that at Celtic. He developed it and he realised pretty soon that it wouldn't be. And I think probably Ange was a big part of that. But see Yang, I just think that that's the last time I want to see him performing like that, right? Whereby yeah. there's no going in full-blooded for a tackle when you're 3-2 up and you're in injury time. And, you know, you're basically, your job at that point, right, is to assume a position between Matondo and Liam Scales. If you do that, the job's done. He's not getting a yeah. shot. He's not getting a clear shot in. That's all it's you need basic. to do. It's Absolutely. Basic. And I never want to see that again from him because if he can't add that to his game, he's not a Celtic player, I'm afraid. Yeah. It, it, when he came on, uh, prior to him coming on, rather, uh, I had some shout on the wall to him and he was like, uh, I said, well, you know, Yang could come on, couldn't fade and not really influence the game. I thought, you know, Maybe it's an opportunity for Yang to come on, maybe drive the, the, you know, give the, the defender a hard time. He was saying, no, bring on Forrest. You want a bit of experience, you want a bit of, um, you, you know, bit of that example of someone that's done it before, you know, and kind of knows what it takes to get us over the line. Um, and I thought, yeah, you know what, you're actually right. And then sure enough, you know, I know I'm going to hear it, my dad's right, but I have to give him the credit. He, he was probably right. I think we, we probably needed Forrest at that point because what I saw from Yang wasn't necessarily a lack of effort, but it was, it, it was a lack of intelligence and tactical savvy uh, at that point in the game. We needed we needed simplicity. We needed you go out there, do the jobs, and ultimately forget about scoring, forget about showboating. Just go and help us get that get that match over the line. Um, and as you say, it was quite a basic error that, that, that he made to to allow Matona's goal, taking nothing away for the strike. Great goal. Um, something which kind of you know you get them in games, you just have to hold your hands up. But the build up could be prevented, you know, take him to the byline, push him to the corner, just don't give him the opportunity to do that, particularly when he'd done it the week prior, I believe he'd done it. I know, he did. So we should have had that, we should have had that scouted, you know, just saying. Without a doubt, listen, Chris, it's been great. I was uh, sharing your progress um, on the social media, uh, looking absolutely stunning, <laughs> going around there uh, with your bow tie on. Brilliant. I didn't see much double denim. I seen more kind of Jimmy Bond than, than double denim. <laughs> as, but, a, as, a, as a former, I had the jeans, I had the jeans on the bottom. You know, but, uh, <laughs> mm, that's good to have you back, mate. It's good to have you back. And, uh, yeah, and of course, I missed it. I missed if, it. You want, if you want to get involved in what we're doing here, not just uh, remotely, but you can come along to one of the Celtic State my nights they're they're growing in popularity they're brilliant nights with a couple last week with paddy mccourt another cult hero uh phenomenal next up is martin o'neill and we just released the final 50 tickets i think 15 of them are gone already i think we're on about 35 if my maths are right that should be an easy kind of uh, equation to work out but yeah there you go 35 tickets left and the ticket link is underneath as that at the bottom says that we ticker tape underneath this video click on the link yeah. Come along. Do you know I've got to give a wee shout out to my missus here. So um that's actually my wife's birthday, uh the twenty-fifth of April, and she's agreed to to come to the Martin O'Neill gig with me uh on her birthday. So I'm gonna to have to take her out beforehand and spoil her and then we'll be at the we'll be at the gig. But yeah, that's I've got I've got to say, you know, that's uh if any, anyone's thinking what love represents for a Celtic fan, that's that's probably it. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. 100%. And again, what I would say, for anyone who came along the last time, which was about a year ago, actually, by Art and Design, we've added a few elements to the night. So uh, there's quite a bit of video footage, for example, that breaks the, the discussion up. Um, brilliant night, so have a wee sing song, and you can get to meet all the troops in person, not just remotely. So thank you very much, everybody, for getting involved. 1,800 strong on a Tuesday afternoon. Loads to discuss. Let us know in the comments field what you thought of any of the discussion points, who you disagree with, who you agree with, and uh, how you remember Georges Yakamakis. There is a reason for that. Let us know in the comments section. How do you remember Yakamakis? I'll reveal all tomorrow why I'm asking that question. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved, and thank you to Double Denim, Chris McElwain, for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.